Good morning. Nice to see you all here today. Kids, uh, you can head downstairs to your class, go uh, have a good time down there talking about Jesus, and, and uh, you know your teachers have prepared uh, a pretty cool lesson for you. Um, just a couple things about where, what we're doing today, um, uh, not just here at church, but right now, if you have a Bible, you can turn to John chapter 15, we'll get there in a minute. In the next service, we're going to have a baptism, which is why this curtain behind me is open, and um, uh, for those of you who are new, that uh, basically that black area is just full of water, and we're going to baptize uh, Lynn Westland in the next service, um, one of uh, somebody who's new to our church, um, but God has been working in her life, and she wants to share with you a little bit of that. And so if you want to stick around for the next service, the coffee is really good, uh, and uh, you can get a second cup, and right at, after the first song, we'll have that baptism, and we want you all to be able to participate in that. This afternoon, uh, it's supposed to rain, but it's supposed to end at 2. Did you know that? Um, I know that you get up and check the weather forecast, and you weren't expecting the weather forecast at church. Here's why this is important. Because this afternoon, uh, we're all going to go to Sunnybury Bible Camp and just uh, have some fun out there. And just get reconnected um, and uh, have, have some games and stuff for the kid. There's laser tag, um, floor hockey, uh, different gym games, and we'll have a big bonfire and uh, just hang out. And so from 2 to 4, we'd love for you to join us out there. Everybody knows where that is, right? Um, it's down there and around, okay? Um, and uh, you can't miss it if you're on Sunny Break to New Point Road. We would love to have you. Two to four, it's not going to rain. It will have rained, and it will rain later, but it's not going to rain while we're there, okay? All right? And if it is, we'll be okay, okay? So hope you're able to make it out to that. That's for everybody, right? If you don't have kids, still come. It's just a, just a cool thing to do. If you're not an extrovert, still come. Introverts, okay? It's okay, all right? You'll be okay. All right? It'll be all right. You don't have to come for the whole time. Just come for 20 minutes. You'll end up staying for 45, and you'll get your extrovert on. John chapter 15, uh, we have been looking at uh, Jesus' final sermon, and we've been doing so in preparation for uh, Easter Sunday, which is uh, uh, just a month away. And uh, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his leaving, right? And he's done this weird thing in, in his teaching. He's saying, it's good that I'm going away. From you. Two weeks ago, we, we heard him say that it's good that I'm going away because I'm going to prepare a place for you. That Jesus was going to go to heaven and make a place for each one of them, a unique, a unique place uh, in the Father's presence, a place just for them. Last week, we heard how it would be good because if Jesus uh, left, he would send the Holy Spirit, and through the Holy Spirit, the disciples and anybody of faith, that is anyone trusting in Christ for salvation, would do great things, even greater things than Jesus. What are those great things? They're the things that bring life to the spirit, that God was a God who gives life to the soul and the body. And through the gospel, uh, which brings Jesus into people's midst by the Holy Spirit, he would visit new life, and this would be a greater work. And so Jesus is saying, it's a good thing that I'm going away. The disciples are struggling with that. They don't really know what to do with that. They don't like the idea of being separated from him. They're struggling with the thought that God would be distant. Have you ever struggled with that? Ever struggled with the idea that somehow uh, God seems far away? I know that there's seasons in my life, I think I'm in a, one right now, where it appear where prayer seems difficult, like that there's this great distance between me and God. But Jesus wants to assure them that that's certainly not the case, that whether or not we feel it, that even whether or not we believe it, Christ is near, Christ is in. He's in us by the Holy Spirit when we place our faith in him for salvation. When we trust him for life, he comes inside of us, and he's that close. It's like the Bible says, we are one with Christ, united with him, and then our lives are hidden with Christ in God. It's a powerful beautiful spiritual truth. He builds on that idea, and we're going to pick up uh, that here by uh, reading in John 15. I'm going to read 1 through 17, okay? And if you have a Bible, you can read. If you have binoculars, you can read the screen behind me, all right? I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. 
I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit, so prove and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant doesn't know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. This is God's word. There's a lot in this passage. And uh, we're going to try to unpack it as best we can in a way that, that I hope will be uh, life-giving for you as well. Uh, Jesus has just finished chapter 14 by saying, let's go. Hey, he's, he's taught them about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit was coming, but he continues to teach them as they leave that upper room, that place where they've had the Passover dinner, where he's washed their feet, and where he has begun to teach them. They're going to begin the, about the five-kilometer walk to Gethsemane, to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's going to teach them along the way. That would be like walking from here to Canoe Beach, okay? It's not that far, okay? We think it's far because we drive places. For them, not far, right? They walked hundreds of kilometers on a regular basis, so this was just like a, like a little wander uh, through the city. About, uh, along the way, they would pass by the temple. The temple would be like from uh, here to, say, uh, the high school. And, and in front of the temple, at the top of the Songs of Ascent, King Herod had placed this giant sculpture, gold sculpture of a vine bearing fruit. It was to remind the people, at least that's what it should have been there for, it was to remind the people that they were to be fruitful by God. Psalm 80 says this about the people of Israel. It says, you brought a vine out of Egypt, you drove out the nations and planted it, you cleared the ground for it, and it took root and filled the land. The mountains were covered with its shade, the mighty cedars with its branches. That was there to remind the people of Israel that they were to bring truth and goodness and beauty to the, one another and to the whole world. I'm sure that as they wandered by there through the valley of Kidron, uh, they would be going past vineyards. So this was a very apt and present illustration that Jesus is trying to get them to understand. But the truth couldn't be more clear, could it? That life is found in Christ, and it's the connection to the vine by which the branches bear fruit, and it's our connection to Christ as the vine that we bear fruit. Why does that matter? Because it's the redemption of the very first commandment, the very first call in the whole Bible. That after God created everything, man and woman, male and female in his image and for his glory, he says to them, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. Right? This is before sin has happened. This is before the rebellion has taken place. That human beings' destiny, their calling, their duty on the earth was to spread God's glory through fruitfulness. That they were supposed to move, that they were supposed to multiply, and that by that they would fill the earth with the glory of God, which was written in all of their hearts, right? It says that creation speaks forth the glory of God, but we were created to image God's glory even to that creation. And so God's glory would fill the whole earth as people were fruitful, multiply, and move. But instead of movement, as a result of sin, there was idleness, right? That instead of fruitfulness, there's impotence. And because said of multiplication, there is now consumption, okay? That what sin does is it twists everything, right? And, and when sin entered the world, people said, I just don't want to go anywhere right? I don't really want to do anything. Instead of fruitfulness and multiplication, there was just consumption, right? I'm just going to use up the earth, not be fruitful in the earth. You get what I'm saying? 
So when Jesus says this to the disciples, he's reminding them, first of all, of what the first commandment, the first calling was. That the whole reason God created the earth was to fill it with his glory and was going to do that by empowering the people to be fruitful, to go multiply and fill the earth. We see this happen when, you know, a number of days later, the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples and they preach the gospel in a way that everybody could hear it. Right? In Jerusalem, people of, of different languages were gathered there, but they all heard the gospel in their own language and took that gospel, that beautiful, true, good word, back to their nation, back to their country. And God accomplished that first movement, that first calling through the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Right? He's telling them, This fruitfulness, this life is meant to bloom and bless others. What we've got in this passage is truth and beauty and goodness. And when you've got truth and beauty and goodness, you've got God's glory. When you've got those three things together, you've got the glory of God. And in this case, you've got the gospel of God. Those three things together. I thought about that a little bit and and thought I'd share with that, that if you have truth and beauty without goodness, you have irrelevance, right? You have irrelevance. That's why I don't understand decorative cherry trees. They look nice, but they're teasing you, right? There's no cherry going to come from this? Okay, that's why the word decorative is in there, okay? It's beautiful and it's true, but it's, it's fine, right? What would be better? A flower that produces a cherry, right? Flowers that lead to fruitfulness is awesome. Flowers that are flowers that lead you to joy, fine. You know, enjoy them. I've just lost half the crowd. I've lost all the flower-loving people. (laughs) Truth plus goodness minus beauty, that's consumerism, right? When we just kind of consume all the goodness on the earth as much as we possibly can, it's something I think we've been guilty of, especially in the last hundred years. Goodness plus beauty minus truth, sentimentalism right? Well, do whatever you think feels right to you, right? No matter what that might cost someone else. That's sentimentalism. But truth, goodness, and beauty, that leads to fruitfulness. And that's what's in this passage. And I'd like to show you that by unpacking four truths that we get from this passage of Scripture. Okay? Four truths are this. First of all, the source of life is in Christ. Second of all, there's the lifting of the branch in life. Third, there's nourishment in the word, or the pruning of the Father and the nourishment of the word. And those things should not be a threat to us. They should be something that we find a great deal of delight in and fruitfulness in, okay? Four things. First of all, we have life by the vine, that life is found in Christ. That's what Jesus says. You're only alive when you're in me. To be a Christian is to know that, that we are in Christ. There would be many different identifiers that the disciples would take in their lives. Uh, They would want to be known as disciples. They would want to be known as saints. But the word Christian is one that we've all kind of embraced now. And do you know what that simply means? It means to be Christ one. In Christ. That word now has actually lost all of its meaning. In a, lot of respect, in a lot of respects. And we as the church, we who would identify ourselves as Christians, need to grab on to a redefining of what that word actually means because it means that we're in Christ. In fact, it's the major identifier in the New Testament. That to be in Christ, that phrase, appears 200 times in the New Testament. More than disciple, you know, more than saint. 200 times a Christian is referred to as one who is in Christ. Why? Because all of life comes from Christ. You cannot be alive apart from Christ spiritually. You can't. You can't. We're dead in our sins. We're dead in our trespasses. But Christ has made us alive to God, to the Father, right? It's this wonderful, beautiful truth of new birth. And it's only found in him. A couple weeks ago, we read how Jesus said this, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life, okay? We don't look for life apart from him. Why? Because you're not going to find it, right? You're not going to find it. A lot of people are wandering the world looking for themselves. Anyone who wants to find themselves needs to find Jesus because life is found in him. Second thing we see is 
when we recognize that our life is in Christ, we have a relationship not just with the vine, but with the gardener. The vine dresser is that classic old uh, word that is used there. It says there at the very beginning that any branch that does not bear fruit, he removes. And it's actually a poor translation that that word remove is the word ero, A-E-R-O in the Greek. That's not the actual Greek, but that's how we would translate it in English from the Greek. And it means uh, four different things, can mean four different things. There's, it's a lifting up. Figuratively, it would be lifting up your eyes would be arrow. Sometimes you, it would be referred to in lifting up to remove something, like picking up a box and moving it. And the fourth meaning would be to remove. Okay? Translators have used that last meaning. But I think there's something significant in the idea, in the belief that, that a branch that is laying on the ground cannot bear fruit, so the vine dresser lifts it up, puts it on a trellis that it might be exposed to light and be in the environment for growth. Okay? We know that there's a pruning that takes place, and so if the branch needs to be cut and needs to be removed, it will be. But in a sense, we're given a picture also of how the vine dresser comes alongside and lifts up the branch so that it can be in the light. I'm no gardener. Obviously, I've proven that already today, right? I don't like, I don't like flowers, and I don't really garden. But I do know this, that things laying on the ground will rot. Will rot. But there's still life in there. And the idea that the vine dresser would lift the branch up to put it on a trellis is wonderful, that he puts it in an environment for its growth, for its growth, for its life to flourish. I think that's one of the great images of the church, that the church itself exists as a trellis by which the vine grows so that the world can see and enjoy the beauty and the goodness of the gospel, the trellis and the vine, right? This is what God does, is he brings us, puts us in environments where we can grow. He also prunes, the father prunes, right? This, in the Greek, is a word katharizo, from which we get catharsis. It means to cleanse, purify, make clean. Normally, this would uh, be uh, the idea of removing moss or, or any kind of disease off of the branch, maybe even insects, but there's also this, this view of pruning. And it's hard to escape the fact that there's a work of removal, and what pruning is, is it's removing anything that would be detrimental to a fruitful harvest. This is the kindness of God. He looks at our lives, elevates us to a place where growth and flourishing can occur, and then takes off the pieces so that the life and the energy can be moved closer to the vine, closer to the branch to bear fruit, right? That's what pruning is. That's why prune trees bring about the most flowers and the most fruit, because the energy isn't being wasted. When God comes into our lives, when he points out things that are dead, that need to be removed, it's because he wants us to be fruitful. And it may be him pointing out some of the things that need to just go. It might be habits uh, that need to be stripped away, priorities that need to be reordered, values that need to be changed. It might be the removal of people or things that are stealing our life. Jesus cares about our lives. He cares about our joy. We've seen that, that promise in there. I've told you these things so that your joy would be full. That his commandments given are out of love and for life. And if he says, don't do something or stop doing something, it's because he wants us to have victory. He wants us to have life in order that we might be fruitful, in order that we might give the truth and the beauty and the goodness to the world and spread his glory. That's what he's doing. That means we welcome his pruning, don't we? We carry our scars in a way. Ever seen that on a tree, a, br uh, a branch that's been cut? You can see the scar that is there, but the branch is fruitful. I think in a lot of ways, some of the things that are stripped away from our lives are opportunities for us to show through our scars the truth and the beauty and the goodness of God. I've been taken with a verse. I don't know why I can't shake it. It's in Hebrews chapter 11, where uh, we have kind of a whole list of all of these Bible characters and how they lived out their faith. And it speaks of Jacob. It says, By faith Jacob, as he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshipped while leaning on top of his staff. Right? It means that he was an old man and he had a staff. But his staff was there because he carried a wound. Right? 
where he had once wrestled with God and God had dislocated his hip in order to bless him, in order to give him a new name and therefore a new life, he said, I'm going to wound you. And Jacob lifted his whole life with a staff. And at the very end, he finished his life, which is a miracle in itself, worshiping God, seeing resurrection in his own body and even in his family. Because it's that he blessed the sons of Joseph means that a son that he thought was dead had come back to life. This is the kindness and the goodness of God. He comes into our lives to remove the things that he knows will kill us so that he can show us resurrection. He can show us resurrection. That any of those things that he wants to remove, he does so so that he can show his power in our lives. It might be an idol. It might be a priority. It might be a person who is over-influencing us and leading us astray. God comes in and says, we've got to fix this. And it's his kindness that does it the pruning of the Father. And then there's the nourishment. How does that nourishment take place? It takes place through the Word. Jesus had assured the disciples they were clean, but he wants them to not just be clean, but also be strong. And says in verse 7, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is where our confidence lies, that our union with Christ, that we're one with Christ, is when it's reflected in our communion with him, when we're living in his words, when we're hearing him speak to us. How does he speak? Through the scriptures, through the Bible. These wonderful, powerful, life-giving truths, right? That change and remind us of the change that Christ has done for us. There's this connection that in order to live life to the full, in order to live a life that is holy, that is godly, that is righteous, that is, is the full fulfillment of the design with which we were created, we need to live by the words of God. We see this pattern in the Old Testament. In Colossians, um, Paul says, as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, walk in him. Walk in him, walk with him. How do we do that? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Hey? Jesus says to the disciples later, you know, when he prays, he says to actually God, but he's praying for the disciples, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is the truth. Sanctification is this word that means to be given life and nourishment and to be cleansed from all impurities that we find our strength when we're in the scriptures. Here's the thing. Some of us are so weak and struggling that it feels like life is being sucked out from us by the circumstances that we find ourselves in and we think we're almost starving or drowning or whatever analogy you need to use. And that might be because we're outside of God's word. We're not sitting under the preaching of the word and we're not opening it up on our own when we're at home. We're not going to church and we're not reading our Bibles. When we're not doing that, we're not being fed, right? You're not being fed. There's no nourishment in all of that. A couple years ago, I tried to get in shape. It's come together reasonably well, Um, though some people are very concerned that I have some sort of disease or parasite. Um, because I've lost a bit of weight, right? You eating enough? You okay? Right? You know, tapeworm? No, nope, nothing like that. All on purpose. Here's what I've realized, is that when I am focused on my health, my body wants better, more nutritious things, right? When I'm focused on living a healthy life, I want fruit and vegetables, you know, um, foods with substance to them. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? If you don't, you need to start eating better. (laughs) You need to start eating better, right? Got to put away the cheesies because that's just cheese-flavored air, man. Like that's, we got to put that stuff away, right? Jesus is saying here, you want to be nourished on the truth. There is truth out there, but the truth of the gospel is the goodness and the beauty and a nourishing that gives strength to our bodies. Isn't this passage is so full of promises. That's so amazing. It's so incredible that Jesus says to the disciples, here's your new reality. There's life. It's found in me. I am with you. I will bring fruit from you. I will give you everything you need in order to be fruitful, in order to go into the whole earth, multiply, and fill the earth with God's glory. I'm going to give you everything you need to do it. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, we read often the negative ones, right? We're like, 
if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Well, Jesus, really? Right? Like we kind of, we look at some of those commandments. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, I'm going to try anyways. Right? You ever do that? Jesus is like, apart from me, you can do nothing. Well, let's see. That's what I do. Hey, I'm going to prove it to you. Right? I'm going to prove it to you. Watch this. Watch this. It's so incredible that he would say to them, here's the life that I'm going to give you. Here's the joy that I'm going to give you. Here's the love that I'm going to give you. Here's, here's, here's this image, this illustration that will define you, that you will be in me and I will be in you. And apart from me, you can do nothing. So just live into this. And, and we know they go, I don't know. Right? I don't know. We do this, right? We kind of just try to live our life on our own. I'll take that under advisement, Jesus. I've spoken about that often, but feel the need to kind of bring it up often, right? That he's not our life coach, right? He's not our peer. He's not our buddy. You know, he's not our counselor. He's a counselor, but not just a counselor. He's somebody who comes into our life to give us everything we need. He's our Lord and our Savior. He's our director. He's the one who's showing us what he is doing in us so that we could see what he can do through us. And we can't do anything apart from him that will have any value. We'll deceive ourselves into thinking it, but ultimately it will lead to death. It should humble us. It humbles me to know this, that you know, regardless of the vessel that is preaching the gospel, even if it brings about fruit, that vessel can be broken and unhealthy and sinful, and God will still use that vessel in the preaching of the gospel to bring about fruit. So many men, so many women have deceived themselves into thinking that they can walk in their sin and still have an effective ministry. That doesn't say anything about them or how serious their sin is or lack thereof in their minds. What it is saying is, is here's how powerful the gospel is. That even when we're doing it apart from God, he's still going to accomplish his purposes. So why wouldn't we get over ourselves and tap into that power that is given to us? Apart from him is death. Apart from his, him is death. And I think this is why a lot of people have just given up on believing these promises and seeing if they're true. Because we've tried, right? And we're tired. We're burned out. We're disillusioned. We're distracted. All of these things which kind of about, bring about almost death, not life. See, ministry, life apart from Christ will only lead to pain and death and destruction four ways I see, I've seen this. There's like a detachment. Jesus says to the disciples, love one another. You ever love someone and got hurt? Anybody? Right? So we say, no, I need, I need to protect myself. The love, we're going to talk about that in a minute, that Christ calls us to as a sacrificial love. But because we've been hurt by love, we detach. So we're willing to speak truth and try to encourage people, but we won't sacrifice ourselves or take any risks out of love. I need to just be guarded so that I don't get hurt. When I was coming up through Bible school, um, uh, a lot of the professors who taught me had gone through very, very difficult things, and they taught us to put strict boundaries on our lives. And for, particularly for young men, they emphasized that with women, right? And what I've realized over the last 25 years of ministry is how how unhealthy and harmful that was to my ministry was that there had to be kind of arm's length with women, that you couldn't trust a woman. And I repent of that. And I apologize for that. And I see that, that I took something that I was being taught and applied it in a way that I never should have. That one of the problems we have in the church is that we, as men, as leaders, don't let women close. I'm not saying that we get reckless with that, but I'm also saying we're not so detached from others that we don't try to show Christ to them, you know? I don't know if that makes any sense. I can explain it later. There's this disillusionment where we try to serve and we try to come alongside the church and it just doesn't work, right? Um, I've seen that in a very personal way with somebody who's very, very close to me, served in the church and just basically said, this doesn't work, so I'm out. There's kind of this disillusionment. And, and not just the church doesn't work, but Christianity doesn't work. And therefore, Jesus doesn't work. And a disillusionment comes in because they were trying to do it in their own strength, right? A burnout. You know, this idea that only I can do something. And that's not true. 
right? Listen, I've been here for, how long have we been here? Oh, a long time, 17 years. Not 17 years, 14 years. Amy was 10 days old when we moved here, right? I know that if something happens to me and I'm gone tomorrow, you'll forget about me in two weeks, all right? Because you don't need me. There's so many more people. There's always somebody coming up through the ranks. But if we think that we need to do everything and that if the whole world's going to fall apart, we're going to kill ourselves. Parents, do you understand what I'm saying? Right? It is not your job to save your kids. It is your job to show them Jesus. And you're not going to get it right, and that's a good thing. So that they don't become dependent on you to do everything for them. Okay? You don't have to make all their phone calls. You can say to them, you're 28. <laughs> you can call the doctor yourself. <laughs> Distraction. Maybe I'm doing the wrong thing. Maybe this isn't my gift or my calling. We read about gifts from the Holy Spirit in Romans chapter 12. Things like administration and leadership and teaching and prophecy. Service and mercy and a whole bunch of things. And people just kind of think if I just... Try one, and oh, that doesn't work. I'll just try this one. Oh, that won't work. I'll try this one. Oh, that one won't work. Oh, oh, and you're like, you spent, you know, 72 hours trying that gift, right? Give it a little longer. Give it a little longer. Get distracted. Maybe this next thing will be the thing, right? Maybe if I change my job, change my career, change where I live, then God can use me. You ever say that? You ever hear somebody say that? I just want God to use me. I won't stop anything. Well, I'm just not in the right place. You are where you are, where you are, where you are. Jesus is here, and he can use you. Okay? We don't need to be distraction, deception. I've already mentioned this, but I think it's important. That my ministry is blessed, my sin must be no big deal. My ministry is blessed, my sin must be no big deal. I'm disheartened to hear of Ravi Zacharias, a teacher who had an incredible effect on my own life and my understanding of Christianity and how he lived two lives, a whole separate life full of sin and justified it because his ministry was being blessed or people were being blessed by his ministry, which God was blessing people in spite of Ravi Zacharias, not because of him, not because of him. That's humbling. And finally, then you may just give up. Yeah, it's somebody else's job. It's somebody else's turn to do that. We've got some needs in our church that we could really use some help with. One of them is the nursery, right? So we've got, you're like, oh, Ben, you set us all up. No, I'm not setting you up, okay? We have this nursery. It's a place for parents who are exhausted to drop their kids off so that they can go to church, right? But the only people who can work in the nursery or that are willing to work in the nursery are parents who are tired and burned out and just want to go to church. So you know what happens? They don't come to church. I don't come to church. But there's some of you, and I can see you here. You've raised kids, right? And you could probably come up with 75 minutes. That's all we're asking. To just be in the nursery and hold someone's baby so that they can go to church, right? It's, you're not done yet. We don't retire from this. I like to say that. The, the, the Bible has a word for retirement. It's called heaven. That as long as you have a pulse, you're still called, Okay? And there's some of you who could hold a baby or chase a toddler and it'll be exhausting and it'll be tiring and it'll be loud and it'll be distracting and you'll be like, why am I doing this? Ah, it's so their mom, their dad can listen to the gospel, right? And then you can come to church after because we've got two services, okay? So Dave's going to be standing at the door signing everybody up, all right? <laughs> you get what I'm coming at? Being exhausted in the nursery to the glory of God, but seeing that that's what gives us life and gives and is fruitfulness is a wonderful, beautiful thing. We as a church need to reclaim this, that we're all, all branches meant to bear fruit, connected to the vine, therefore connected to one another. Connected to one another. It's not someone else's job to do ministry. It's not my job to give money so that someone else can do the job of the ministry. It's my job to partner and be a partner in the ministry. None of that was in my notes, so I'm going to trust the leading of the Holy Spirit in speaking of all of this, okay? And again, just remind us that, that this is the call that we had in Genesis chapter 1. And where does it take place? It takes place in the loving relationships that we have. You can't be a Christian in isolation. A branch can't bear fruit apart from the vine. 
right? Not just apart from Christ the vine, but apart from the, the bigger vine. And that's why he says to them and finishes with that, love one another. He gives them a new measure of love, right? A new measure of love. That love would be permanent. In chapter 13, it says, Jesus says, I've loved you to the end. That that was kind of a theme of even of this, one of the, the minor themes within this, within this passage of scripture, that Jesus loved them to the very end, right? That there was a permanence to his love, that love was not conditional, that love was not transactional, that he loved them to the end, that he loved them sacrificially, Right? No greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. That he be willing to place himself under submission to somebody else and to put aside his entitlements and his rights in order to love somebody that they might receive what they need. This is the power of love. This is the measure of love that Christ gives to the disciples, that it would be permanent and that it would be sacrificial. Permanent and sacrificial. Because it's a love, it's a love that can change lives. It's a love that can change eternities. It's a love that can transform everyone. It's a love that has to be of great priority. You can't have this life apart from loving others. And so Jesus says to them, you will love one another like I love you. Remember, this isn't something we're trying to get come up with, right? You're like, okay, well, what does this mean? What do I have to do? Uh Uh-uh, it's not that. It is receiving the love of Christ and allowing that love to overflow into the lives of others, right? It's being willing to make the sacrifices and being willing to be in permanent loving relationships with others, right? To not chase our entitlements, to not chase our rights, not to chase our own wants and our own needs, to not seek to love ourselves in order to justify not loving somebody else. Here's what the world wants you to do. You just need to love yourself. That's where you find your life. You try to do that, you're going to find yourself chasing after your tail forever and ever and ever. Because you're going to do something that, that you realize is stupid and dumb. And I go, I don't really like myself. How can I love myself? So stop doing that and receive the love of Jesus. And let that be what allows you to love others well with sacrifice and permanence for all time. It's a beautiful and powerful thing. He says, love one another with the same love that I have loved to you. No greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Vladimir Putin claimed that verse this last week, right, as justification for a war for his own glory, and he will stand before Jesus, and he will be condemned to hell if he does not repent before then, because you do not get to take this kind of love and blaspheme Christ by it to justify our own needs and our own wants. Sacrifice means putting aside our own entitlements, aside our own rights, that we might love others in spite of them, in spite of whether, what we get out of it. That means we look at other one another and say, they're in Christ, so am I. They are worthy of the love of Christ, so am I, because of the grace of Christ. Because of the grace of Christ that says, I'm going to love you and you and you and you. We don't get to choose who we love anymore. We don't get to choose who we love anymore. We've got to be careful about who we trust, but that doesn't mean we don't love one another. And Jesus calls them to that, to love others the same way that I have loved you, verse 12. What does that mean? It means we choose sacrifice instead of entitlement. That we're not in relationships for what we're going to get out of it. That we choose forgiveness rather than offense. Oh, here's a big one. Like, I'm running out of time. But this is important. We live in a culture that is looking to be offended all the time. Do you know why? Because they don't want the obligation to love somebody who they disagree with. If I can be offended, then I don't have to love you. Think about it, right? I look around the room, there's a lot of people who I've offended who aren't here, right? Because it's just what we do now. Instead of being offended, could we forgive Instead of being offended, we need to forgive so that we're not allowing any relationship to be threatened on the basis of my hurt. But because we're so focused on injustice done to us, right, that we don't trust Jesus 
to take all the justice of those things done to us that we guard ourselves and we break off relationships with people we determine to be untrustworthy. That we would choose empathy over defensiveness. That we wouldn't doubt other people's loves. Instead, we would ask them to love us and to love us well. This is the example that Christ took on the cross. He accepted the judgment of the Father even though he was sinless. That he offered forgiveness rather than claim justice. That he stayed silent in the face of accusation, knowing that he must suffer in order that we might be saved. That in order for us to be loved, Christ took all the unloving, unjust things on himself. And the disciples could have seen the promises of that passage at work the next day. They would see, truly, no greater love has a man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. But they didn't. Why? Because they tried to live the life of faith in their own flesh. It took them 18 hours to forget these words of Jesus and to abandon him and to run and to be about their own self-protection. But the resurrected Jesus pursued them. And the resurrected Jesus is pursuing each one of us because the love of Christ and the love of Christ belongs to us whether or not we're successful or not. God is not asking you to be successful. He's just asking you to be faithful. And Christ is continuing to pursue us. Isn't this awesome? This is this amazing truth that whether or not I get it right, that whether or not I'm like the disciples in abandoning Christ or able to just stay and be someone by whom ministry is done, Christ is faithful continues to pursue all of these men would be pursued by jesus and they would be restored that even in the, his hour of greatest need they abandoned him but he the resurrected jesus came alive and brought them back under his love and it was that love the love of christ who rose from the dead victorious over sin and over satan and death it was that love that changed their lives and our lives each one all but one not each one all but one would give their lives for Jesus to the spreading of the gospel around the world. Thomas, you know Thomas, who we like to call Doubting Thomas, went to India to preach the gospel. You can still see the effects of his ministry there, that people are still coming to Christ because Thomas believed this to be true eventually. Eventually. This is the power of the gospel, is it transcends generations and it fills the whole earth for all time. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Everything we have is in Christ. That's all we need. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we bow before you, we confess, I confess, that life is found in you and you only. That unconditional love is found in you and you only. I confess, Lord, that I've been trying to find life in my job, in my family, in my activities in my ministry. I've been trying to find love from my job, from my family, from my ministry and my activities. And I've tried to do that apart from you, Lord, and many of us have, and what we're realizing is that we're burned out, we're disillusioned, we're distracted, and we're detached. But we rest in the resurrection that you sit at the right hand of God, that you have sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts, that you are still working in our midst, that we might see you raise us from the ground, elevate us, lift us, prune us, that we might experience the life and the fruitfulness that you have not just called us to, but empowered us to have. In your name and for your glory. And so I pray in your name right now that you would visit salvation on those who don't believe here today that you would let those know, let them know that you love them and that you died for them and that if they call on your name for salvation, you will give them that salvation. That for those of us who uh, are going through a season of pruning, that we would rest in it even though it's painful, even though it's difficult, but that we would know that, that even in the pain, you will tell your story and we will be able to testify to your own good, going goodness and grace. Lord, we want to be a fruitful people. We want to be a people that, that speak of your truth and of your beauty and of your goodness, that the world hears it and that the world would be changed by it because we know this. This is the only hope that we have, that anyone has.
and it's found in you and in your name. Thank you for these powerful, beautiful truths that you've given us. As we come to you and take communion together today, it's with confidence that your death, Lord Jesus, has removed all of our sins that we could be forgiven. That your death, Lord Jesus, <laughs> provided the pathway for us to have life. As we recognize that, remember that, would you show us the things that we're trusting that may be apart from you? May you show us those that we need to offer forgiveness from or ask forgiveness from? And even if those things are there that we wouldn't participate in communion, in this forgiveness, until you're making those relationships right. Be glorified in our midst, Lord Jesus. Continue to speak as we respond in worship in your name, I pray. Amen. I'm going to invite